Dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning to those who are in North America. Dobry večer tým, kto sluchuje divice nas v Ukrajini. My name is Aroslav Hrecak. I am professor at the Penny Catholic University in Lviv. And I have a special honor and pleasure to announce beginning of our second meeting within a framework of our book discussion seminar. This is a seminar that uh, focus on the recent publication Ukrainian Studies, uh, more specifically published by Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, the seminar has been organized. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, this is not a remark for me. So the seminar has been organized by the Peter Yatsik Center uh, for Ukrainian uh, Historical Research. We had the first meeting uh, a month ago, and then we discussed the recent biography of Mazepa. This is the book has been written by Tatiana Tairo Yakovlevia. If you have missed uh, this discussion, you may watch this it online. It's available on the website of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and as well on the website of our journal, Ukraine Modern. And today we are going to discuss a very important book on Shridisatniki, a central phenomenon of modern Ukrainian history. This is the book that has been written by Simone Attila Baletsa. I believe many of you has already read, read this book. Uh, for those of you who have not, let just let me assure that this is astonishingly excellent book. And uh, telling proof of it is the uh, fact that the book has been awarded a year ago, a very prestigious prize, the Omelian Pritzak Prize in the Ukrainian Studies for distinguished book in the field of Ukrainian studies. Uh, before we proceed with our discussion, I would like to make some announcement related to technical issues. Uh, the discussion will be held in the format of interview between Dr. Uh, Mark Andrejczyk from uh, Columbia University, it is the author, and the interview then will be followed by the Q&I session. You may participate in this discussion by sending your questions through the chat option. You may find this option in your Zoom in the upper right corner of your device. So please use this option actively. And now I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Heather Coleman. Dr. Heather Coleman is Director of Research Program of Religion and Culture at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And she's also an Associate ed Editor of Canadian Slavonic paper, Papers. Uh, Dr. Heather Coleman knows the book very well, and she kindly agreed to make introductory remarks about the book and its author, Dr. Simone Boletsa. So without a further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Coleman. Please, Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yaroslav. Um, and, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Simone uh, Beletze uh, and, his, and his book. Um, I, uh, uh, as, as Yaroslav mentioned, um, uh, the, um, this book won the Omelian Pritzak Book Prize, and I was a member of the, the committee. And um, and as a as a CIUS person, uh, s sat back in, when the first list was created, but then was very delighted when the committee unanimously agreed that this was um, the the most important book published uh, last year in Ukrainian studies in English. Um, Simone uh, Belezia is assistant professor of modern history at the Department of Social Sciences of the University of Naples, uh, Federico II. Uh, his work has dealt in various ways with the study of national belonging and its relationship with other kinds of loyalties, be they social, political, cultural, or religious. Um, at, at present, he is investigating um, using the Ukrainian case, the importance of the relationship between diaspora communities and their original homeland in the emergence of human rights movements during the Cold War. But today we are focusing on his prize winning book, a book that um, uh, really takes its place um, in uh, what has been an extraordinarily rich um, field of study in Soviet studies, uh, Russian and Soviet and Ukrainian history in the last 20 years, uh, the emergence of the, the 1960s as a field of study. Um, and uh, and the, the thaw and the, the great cultural flowering and, and the complexities of the transformation of the post-Stalinist Soviet Union. 
the Shistisiatniki uh, were a group of intellectuals, um, artists, writers, but also scientists, a range of, of, of scholarly endeavors, who at the end of the 1950s and into the 1960s started to play a particular role in the development of Ukrainian national culture. Uh, many of them were convinced communists. Uh, they're part of this, uh, of this thaw phenomenon, uh, this, this aspiration to, to renovate socialism, <laughs> to create what the Czechs called socialism with a human face. And they're part of that, that movement. Um, they also felt a strong attachment to Ukrainian popular culture and language. And I think that um, when I was reading Simon Neb's books, um, there were many things that attracted me. But one of the things that I think had not been uh, as clear to me before, but reading a book, this book about a cultural movement written by a historian, rather than the earlier literature, which has mostly focused on them as literary uh, as, as cultural producers was the social history component that many of these people are come out of the post-war period when a much broader group of people are getting higher education, are entering the intelligentsia. And we have examples of the, many of these people having rural backgrounds and wanting to bring that rural background uh, to the fore and, and the, an acknowledgement of of the Ukrainian uh, culture of the, the countryside and bringing that to the cities. Um, the, the book uh, draws on exciting new archival material. As we know, the Ukrainian archives are, are far more open than the archives in many other uh, post-Soviet countries. And so um, Simone is able to bring us a, a, a insight from, from, from uh, the archives that uh, we may not have in other settings. But another real advantage of this book are the oral histories that he draws on. He, he, he got to know many of these people and, and we sense that as we read. And so the, the book is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is an inside um, st study of, of the, these 1960s-ers, which is how Shistisiatniki translates, um, uh, but it's also a, a social history. It's also a, a cultural history, uh, placing the, this group in, 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 in these broader important trends in Soviet and East European history of the period. Um, as a result, uh, as we said in our, in our citation for the Omelian Pritzak uh, book prize, we said that the book offers a comprehensive expansively researched and well-written history of a particularly significant phenomenon in Ukrainian cultural and political development. Uh, the book should become a starting point for further research on the Shistisiatniki and that period of Ukrainian intellectual and cultural history for years to come. Today we have, uh, we, 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 we will hear a conversation, a conversation between uh, Dr. Beletsa and um, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Andrechuk. Um, um, Dr. Mark Andrechuk obtained his PhD in Ukrainian language and literature from the University of Toronto in 2005. And at present, he teaches Ukrainian literature in the Slavic department at Columbia University. And he's well known to many of us as the administrator of the Ukrainian studies program at Columbia's Harriman Institute. His mon he's particularly well suited to um, uh, be an interlocutor of uh, Dr. Beletsa. Uh, his own monograph, The Intellectual as Hero in 1990s Ukrainian Prose, was published by the University of Toronto Press in 2012. And, uh, and, and so he, he's very familiar with the, 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 the interrelationship between uh, the cultural producers and broader social trends. So without further ado, I want to welcome uh, both uh, Professor Beletsa and, professor, and Dr. Andrejchuk to uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for the introduction. Uh, 
And thank you to the Peter Yatsik Center for U Ukrainian Historical Research for inviting me uh, to take part in this event. Uh, um, and CIUS Press, of course, the publisher of the book. Uh, I want to also congratulate everybody as today is International Book Day. Uh, so it's very fitting that we get to spend some time uh, talking about a, a wonderful book on this uh, important day. And I'd like to congratulate Simone on uh, getting uh, this, this first time uh, <laughs> recipient of the Omelian Pritzak 2020 book. So congratulations, Simone. Uh, I've prepared a few questions that uh, I'd like to, to, to discuss right now. And then like uh, Heather mentioned, we have a chance later for the public to, to have their own questions. Uh, Simone, um, how important an influence uh, was a generation of Ukraine intellectuals of the 1920s, uh, the so-called Ruslidne Vidrojnya, the Garretted Renaissance, uh, on the Shistidisyadnikin. What was similar in their strivings to create a socialist Soviet Ukrainian culture, uh, and what was different between these two generations? Okay, so uh, good morning. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, before answering the question, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, presentation. Uh, Mark, of course, Heather, Yaroslav, and all the people working like uh, behind the scenes, like Alexander, Mark Stech, uh, Frank Sisin, and so on. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk about my book, of course, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful. Um, and, and thank you also for all the very kind words that you said about my book and all the compliments that you uh, made to me. So uh, going back to the, uh, to the question, I, I, I think that, I mean, assessing to what extent uh, this so-called uh, Rostrilian Evidrogenia, uh, the shot or executed uh, Renaissance, influence the movement of the Shizdesiatniki is difficult to, because, uh, I mean, we, do not know uh, clear enough to what extent this is the ethnic actually knew uh, that previous generation of Ukrainian culture. So, I mean, as I wrote in my book, when uh, Yevgen uh, Sversyuk was able to uh, get one of the copies of the famous book uh, um, uh, prepared by Yuri Lavrinenko, uh, the, the anthology of the poems and writings of the uh, Rostirene Vidrogenia. Uh, he was absolutely surprised by the, all the things that he could read. He also, I mean, even if he, it, it was not uh, really, uh, it was not killed. Uh, when he discovered uh, what uh, a young Ticina could write uh, before becoming just a poet that was celebrating the party was completely surprised. So it, it's difficult because actually understanding from a, let's say from a, a purely artistic point of view, understanding how this previous generation was able to influence the this ethnic key is very difficult because I mean, it perhaps uh, needed a, a specific study. But if we uh, look at the more general cultural and political meaning that this previous generation had for the Shistis ethnic key, of course the influence is uh, uh, absolutely great. It's great because I mean, uh, for the Shisnesi Atniki, um, learning that there had been a previous generation in the Soviet Union that uh, was able uh, somehow to work at the enterprise of building a Ukrainian national culture, but within the Soviet Union, somehow demonstrated to them that that was possible, that the mission that they had in mind, because we have to, uh, I mean, uh, think of the Shizdesiafniki as uh, Soviet citizens and uh, people active in Soviet uh, institutions in the Soviet culture that uh, discovered that uh, their what they thought was going to be what would would be their mission in Soviet culture. This is building uh, a, a national uh, Ukrainian culture, but it's Soviet Ukraine already happened uh, before. And so uh, they were very curious about this generation. I mean, the person that perhaps uh, spent more time uh, looking for information about this generation they were not allowed to uh, properly know, it was perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Lestanyuk, who spent a lot of time uh, uh, trying to find information about Les Kurbas, about Nikola Kulish, because I mean, they were, these were figures very important for his uh, uh, formation as a, as a director uh, uh, in the 50s, in the 60s. And, and so on. But I mean, all, all the shifts the setting were really uh, interested in that. And then 
after that, I mean, they, they, they thought, okay, uh, if there was a generation in the, uh, in the 20s that were working at, at the Ukrainian national culture, then uh, something got wrong, of course, because that was, I mean, even to them in the end known as the shot uh, as the executed uh, uh, Renaissance. And so uh, in some ways, I think that uh, the mere existence of that previous generation demonstrated to them that uh, uh, their, let's say, their interpretation of Soviet history, that there was a period in Soviet history when working at a, uh, a sincere, at a genuine Ukrainian culture was possible, that then something got wrong in history, that is of course Stalinism, and then that also it was possible after Stalinism to go back to working on uh, Ukrainian culture as a real national uh, 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 expression, I mean, uh, as uh, of Soviet and at the same time Ukrainian uh, culture. So I think that uh, this is, I mean, the most important part, not, not the cultural or of course, there were some poetic influence on the on the authors uh, uh, on the uh, or other artists of, of the she's the satniki, but the most important was this function of demonstrating with their existence that there was possible. And so there was hope for future, uh, even if at the end they didn't realize, but I mean, uh, it, it, it was like, uh, uh, I think that it was hope. Uh, and, and okay, I think that this is uh, the main the main reason. Yeah, and well, thank you. Uh... One of the things I really like to hear about your book is that you spent some time talking about uh, Boris Antonenko Davidovich, because I don't think enough attention is given to him uh, as somebody who's really important in the 20th oh. century for uh, for uh, Ukraine culture and all these political movements. So thank you for, very much for that. Uh, uh, one of the things you, that you focus on in your, in, your, in your monograph is this idea of community. And I, I think that was also a very good way of approaching uh, this group of people. And it's something I did in my monograph, but I'm writing about the 1980 years, the and for me, it was the 70 years, the Simdesiatniki that were uh, most influential, this underground Soviet culture of the 1970s that came at the heels of the Simdesiatniki that were very influential on their sense of community. And it was very important for the Simdesiatniki as well. Uh, do you see uh, the Sistisianaki looking to the past for this sense of community? Is this something that they kind of created and passed along? Uh, or is this something that perhaps is in, in native to Ukrainian culture uh, and developments in, in general, this idea that you need to build this community in order to do this? Okay, oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, let me like, uh, tell you a small episode of my research in Kyiv. I mean, I, I felt this kind of community when I made my second oral interview with uh, Lina Kostenko. The first uh, person that I interviewed was uh, Lestanyuk, and then I went to visit Lina Kostenko, and talking to her, I absolutely und understood immediately that she had talked to uh, uh, Lestanyuk before meeting with me. I mean, we, we already had the calendar, but of course, I think that the first thing that Lester New did after meeting with me was taking the phone, calling Lina Kostenko and, and chatting about what we talked about and so on. And I understood that, that this was like a chain. And after me, Lina Kostenko called Ivan Zuba and so on and so forth. So, it, it, and this immediately like hit me like, a, like a, an epiphany, like a revelation that they were a very compact group. There was, these were friends. There was a group of friends and that friendship that was born in the 50s when they just got to know each other uh, lasted until, I mean, the very last days of their life because, okay, uh, fortunately, I mean, uh, Lina Kostenko, Ivan Zuba are still alive, Lestanyuk already passed away, but this is, this is like, this is a, 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 a sort of a feeling community that uh, united them and that survived even through the Soviet Union. So, uh, I mean, going back to your question, yes, I, 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 I am not sure where this sense of community, this feeling of being somehow uh, something, I mean, in between the private and the public sphere came from, there was like, but I think that, I mean, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, uh, she's the Satniki are 
uh, innovating completely the way that uh, um, Ukrainian nationalism is imagined in the political world of, of Ukraine after the Second World War. And I think that uh, they uh, somehow inherited this sense of community from their communist culture. I think that, uh, I mean, the uh, education that they were exposed to was the typical uh, uh, communist uh, education where the importance of the community uh, uh, is cre clearly greater than the, uh, uh, the value attributed to, to, to the individuality. So even if, of course, the, six, the, seven, the Shizdesapniki and the uh, 1960s in general are also, I mean, correspond also to a, a, a rediscovery of the importance of the individual and of individual rights, nevertheless, they uh, somehow uh, perceived their action only with the meaning if it was somehow uh, meant to have a meaning for the whole society, for, for, for the Ukrainian nation as a whole, and not just for, for themselves. And they, they, they um, also, I mean, uh, chatting with uh, Ivan Zuba, even if he, um, uh, he, 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 he said many times that he didn't, didn't want to have any political role uh, during the, the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, he thought that an intellectual, I mean, it is a very high idea, ideal of, of an intellectual, an intellectual, something writing about history, about, history, about literature and so on, had a mission uh, in society, had a role to play in society. So doing culture, they were doing something that had a greater, wider meaning that was also contributing to the creation of it. And so I think that, I mean, and they have this idea that we were a group of friends and what we were doing all together as artists, they were uh, reading one another, they were collaborating to some projects to, uh, uh, together. Uh, it also had some sort of link, something that could contribute to the uh, development of the whole nation. So I think this is, and this is, in my opinion, something new that they get then, then pass to the other generations, to the following generation, the 70s and, and the 80s. Okay, thank you. Uh, several times in your monograph, you point out that most of the Shizdesatnik uh, were not anti-Russian and were not Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, why was it important for you to emphasize this in your study of the Shizdesatnik? And did you think they were anti-Russian nationalists before you started studying them? <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, I mean, well, of course, I mean, there are, two main reasons for that. The first reason is that, of course, I'm also like a man of my time. And so, I mean, as the difference between Russians and Ukrainian and the war going on, even if I started my study of the Shizuzetniki before the Euromaidan and the revolution of dignity, but nevertheless, of course, I mean, after 1991, being Ukrainian, was problematic and there was a reflection going on. And so I uh, decided to study this period of Ukrainian history also to understand what they meant by being Ukrainian. But also there is something that is more like uh, typical of that period is that, I mean, if you really uh, try to read, to understand how these generations in the 50s and in the 60s perform their national identity. We have to say perform because we know that also identity is not the right word. We should say national belonging because identity means that it's always the same. No, and the national identities change every time, every day. So, but if you, if you look at the way they understood their way of being Ukrainian, Soviet or Russian, you can see that it was much more elastic and much more nuanced than it is now. And so the question was how to understand was to understand how somehow these national belongings uh, became more rigid, more fixed, not in, in interchangeable anymore, but for them, it was like that. So for me, it was important to uh, stress that uh, somebody like Lina Kostenko could write a poem about the beauty of Russian language or uh, somebody like uh, uh, Leonid Plush could say that he was at the same time Ukrainian and Russian and Soviet, and for him there was no contradiction. And in some ways, I mean, I think that this way, I mean, uh, recovering this understanding, this way of uh, performing national identities, it has also a political meaning. I don't want to be too much, I mean, too rhetoric in this, but I think that if we understand that national belonging are more elastic and more nuanced, 
somehow we can also understand like nowadays when Putin says there are some people speaking Russian in Ukraine, so I have a legitimacy to go there and protect them. And then we can say, well, no, it is not true. You have no legitimacy on people speaking Russian just because they speak Russian, just because they love Russian culture. This is not something much more complex. And so I think even if, of course, Putin is still going to, I mean, uh, do war against Ukraine if he has the, the power to do that, nevertheless, I mean, understand that there's no legitimacy has, has some importance. And so I, I hope that, I mean, stressing this, uh, uh, this point is not something like anti-Ukrainian, but somehow allows us to understand how, how this dynamics work and also may have some political uh, uh, benefit from them. Understood, understood. Uh, do you believe there was a certain moment when the Shistisadnik, you know, they were trying to to revive, uh, the, as you explained in your book, you know, some of the major um, goals they set was kind of, you know, revising Ukrainian culture, allowing for, for expression of Ukrainian culture and also of, of the individual, yes, uh, the voice of the individual. Um, and they were trying to do this within, you know, the framework of, of you know, the Soviet constitution and, and the times and the place where they lived. Uh, was there a certain time where they realized that this is not going to happen? <laughs> uh, this, you know, things, things change, unless things change drastically, nothing is, we're not going to be able to do this. Uh, was it a certain moment? Was it a gradual tendency? How did they, how did they come about this realization? Well, uh, this is a very difficult question because I think that uh, this moment came for different people in a different period of time. I mean, some of the Shistesatniki perhaps were already doubting that the Soviet Union was the right country, the right state where to have Ukrainian uh, national culture, a genuine uh, national culture, even in the uh, late 50s or early 60s, especially, I mean, I think those coming from Lviv, of course, they had different history, they had different experiences also before uh, the war, so, and, and their family histories were different, and so perhaps they were doubting about the right no, they did say that about communism and socialism as right ideologies even before. And for other people, I think that what, what it's important to understand is that for them, uh, it was a very painful process to understand that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was not a, a good option for that. Because, for example, when I met with uh, uh, Ivan Zuba, uh, even before starting the interview, so I was not able to record to record this because he started just telling me this, and it was, uh, you know, I want you to know that the Soviet Union was not only bad. I was poor. I was uh, ill, and the Soviet Union allowed me to study in the best university, and the Soviet Union uh, 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 sent me to the best uh, sanatories, and so on. So the Soviet Union was not only wrong. And that really, I mean, struck me because I understood that this was, I mean, many, many years ago. So, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, so they perceived themselves as the best product of uh, Soviet culture, Soviet Ukrainian culture. So for them, I mean, that genuinely had hope for the Soviet Union to be that state that could realize those ideas that they believed in. It was very painful. And so I think, I mean, there are people who did the process very, uh, very quickly, like uh, Moroz, for example, and other people like Lina Kostenko or Ivan Zuba that, uh, I mean, needed more time. Perhaps, I mean, a turning point is 1968 because after the repression in Czechoslovakia, many people started to doubt that something was wrong and perhaps even felt that, I mean, also um, uh, Shellist was involved in the, in the Czechoslovakian crisis. But the, I, I think that for many of them, it was, was a, a long process. So for, for Zuba, for example, it took perhaps the whole seventies before really, I mean, deciding that yes, he, he had to do uh, or, or um, I, I don't know, but I think that uh, it's it's uh, it's difficult to to find a point, but it's a very mm -hmm. long process. Right, and, and you spend a lot of time in the books writing about uh, 1968 and how important that was and how it affected both the Shizhiatnikia and the powers mm -hmm. that be. Then, uh, 
How important was it for like-minded individuals uh, in other republics uh, outside of the Ukrainian social, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic and also in, uh, in Czechoslovakia and Poland and the other Soviet bloc states, how, how well did, were they informed with what the Shistisatniki were doing in Ukraine? Uh, was it more of just isolated thing within Ukraine or, you know, we had Ukrainian communities in all of these uh, republics and countries as well. Uh, were they in informed of what's happening and, and how important if they were, was it that there was connections outside of Ukraine with these people uh, and not just the bourgeois West <laughs> who were, you know, doing the, some, some of the Dao uh, publications? Well, I think that the stronger connections were with the people, and, and if we can call them dissidents, but intellectuals in, in Poland and in Czechoslovakia. I think that actually the Shistis ethnic is suffered a little bit from his isolation from the Russian intellectuals and the Russian uh, uh, dissidents to be. And uh, I had this impression, for example, Alla Horska, uh, tests about the fact that when she went to visit Moscow, and I mean, we have to keep in mind that uh, Alagorska grew up as a Russian speaking. So for, for her, of course, Russian culture was not something uh, extraneous to her, even if she was so, so nationalistic. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I, I think that uh, she, she, she understood that people in Moscow were not interested even in what was going on in Kyiv. And for her, it was a sort of a trauma, uh, not finding some sort of correspondence of, of feelings with, with, with intellectual, with artists in, in Moscow. So I think that, uh, I mean, they had a lot of, uh, for, for all the Shistis ethnic, uh, the relationship with the Polish intellectuals was very important also because uh, Poland was a little more open to the West. And so they looked at the Poland and, and Polish culture as a way to get to know what was going on in the rest of the world. And, 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 and uh, also Polish students were very uh, happy, those who were visiting Ukraine to discuss with them and to have some uh, uh, conversation about uh, what was going on and, and how to uh, imagine a different, uh, even uh, socialist world. So I think that uh, uh, the, the strongest, and then there were some uh, I, I haven't found documents about that, but it was clear that uh, um, uh, until 1968, for example, culture, even cultural institutions in Czechoslovakia and in Poland were trying to support uh, the Shistesiatniki, making them published in, in, in Czechoslovakia and in Poland where they were not allowed to publish in Ukraine anymore and something like that. So there was very, very, very strong uh, connections, even if, uh, I mean, uh, that this is a field that you still have to study to understand exactly uh, who, who helped them and who was, I mean, also in a position to keep this, uh, this connection alive. And, and, and uh, just finally, uh, when I read uh, uh, Lyudmila Alekseyeva uh, book about dissent in, in the Soviet Union, I was a little surprised about the little she knew about the uh, movement in Ukraine. Of course, Alex Seva was, I mean, a great historian, a great activist and so on. But for example, in the way she summarized in, already in, in, the, in the 80s, in the 90s, the movement in Ukraine, she made a lot of mistakes. She didn't really got who were the most important people, who were uh, who the leaders, who the followers. So, the, so, so it, it, I mean, it's, it's a sign that uh, perhaps in Moscow or, or Russian people did not really know what was going on in, in uh, 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 in Kyiv, even if, of course, there were people who were more uh, uh, more familiar with the uh, Ukrainian situation. Yeah, it was uh, several years ago. We had a conference on uh, nonconformity and dissent at the Harriman Institute at Columbia, and we had a panel of of dissidents, and we had Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian, and it was fascinating. Uh, we had the Litvinov speaking with Marinovich and uh, these two people that, you know, Sedila that sat and it was the first time they were like talking to each other. And it was just amazing. To, they were talking about how, what they knew about one another and what they didn't know about one another. So uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you also, uh, there are key figures in your book uh, that you focus on to, to tell this story. Uh, one is Petros Shalest, yes, uh, and you know, previous works they've written about Shitty a lot of them focus on you know the Shalest versus Sherbitsky debate where things were so good under Shalest and they were so bad under Sherbitsky, but you paint them a little bit differently, Shalest, uh, as being not so, <laughs> not so, um, 
Emma Gould to the Shistisatniki. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this important figure uh, uh, in this period of time and his relationship with this group? Yes, of course. I mean, I have to acknowledge my doubt to uh, Yuri Shapoval, actually, because he was reading his researches about uh, Shellis that I started to think that perhaps Shellis was not as uh, uh, such a friend of Dishis the Satniki as, as we uh, used to think. And yes, I think that, I mean, um, uh, we have to think of Dishis the Satniki as a typical Soviet phenomenon. And that the consequence is that. Uh, both them and the party didn't perceive them automatically as enemies, at least at the beginning of the 1960s. And so I think that there was a period where actually they uh, all together, I mean, the, the historiography on, on the Soviet Union uh, uh, speaks about a real of the Soviet Union at, in, the, in the 1960s. So there is a moment where uh, uh, Soviet leaders and intellectuals are thinking of what to do with the Soviet Union after Stalin died. And so I think that uh, there was a time where when uh, people were actually thinking that there were some uh, more opportunities to develop uh, uh, the, the Soviet Union in, in a different uh, direction. And of course, uh, I mean, Brezhnev uh, 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 came to power and that changed everything. And I think that um, um, Shellis was somehow uh, friends with people who were genuine helpers of the Shiz Desiatniki, like for example, Oles Gonchar. Gonchar was absolutely a, a communist writer, but nevertheless, it was somebody from a, a little previous generation that was uh, willing to help them and to try to build a different culture, a different way of doing uh, art in, in Soviet Ukraine. And uh, Shellis at the beginning had the same disposition. And then, I mean, his political culture uh, 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 was decisive. I mean, he, 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 in, in his diary, for example, he always speaks of Stalin in very high terms, uh, even if he was like a head of the commission, I mean, revising uh, uh, all, the, all the trials of the uh, uh, 1930s. And I mean, and, and so I think that uh, in the end, we, we have this idea of Shellis as, a, um, uh, as somebody uh, closer to the Shistisatniki just because, uh, I mean, of course it was liquidated uh, in, uh, in 1972, 73, but that was due to the fact that uh, as, as always in the Soviet Union, where you have a, a regional or a local power that is trying to uh, get some sort of independent power from the center, you have a fight going on. And so Shellis, as the first secretary of the Communist Party in Ukraine was trying to assess, uh, I mean, affirm himself as, a, as an independent uh, political uh, figure. And Brezhnev in the end looked at that and said, okay, now we have the uh, the Shellis problem and, and decided to, to solve this problem. And, and, and the reason, I mean, uh, publicly perhaps the reason was that uh, um, uh, Shellis was too Ukrainian, was uh, too close to these nationalist figures. And perhaps even the Shiz Desapniki got a little bit like uh, uh, fooled by these ideas uh, uh, at the beginning. They had a hope for Shellis to, uh, 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 to have them, but uh, th th these are like, I mean, uh, they, they, they didn't really realize what was going on in the, in the Ukrainian political system. So I think that no, there was no, no hope for, for Shellis to actually, and, and as, as we now know, I mean, uh, we, we discovered that uh, decades ago, Shellis was one of the key figures in deciding to uh, invade Czechoslovakia in 1968. So uh, that's, that, that explains everything. I mean, Shellis was afraid of cultural turmoil and wanted to silence it. So uh, that, that this is, and now there is a new book by Bajan on, the, on, on Shellis. So it was just published by uh, uh, like Parlamentske with Avnitsko. I'm very curious. I haven't read it yet, but I think that is also, I mean, I read a few reviews and I know that it's also going in this direction. So Shellis as a very communist, typical communist uh, political figure, even if we didn't expect him to be like that. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed your, your focus on him. And it's, it, yeah, I mean, a lot of these figures seen one way and seen another way almost at the same time. You mentioned Honchar, right? Some people thought he was a reformer of Ukrainian literature with his support, right? And other people thought he was just a socialist realist hack, you know, the worst writers. Uh, I remember there was um, 
unfortunately, a deceased poet, Nazar Honchar, uh, in the 90s uh, from the Luhu Saad group. And he once had a wonderful idea. And you talk a little bit at the end of your book about the postmodernists, but uh, he wanted to take uh, Ole Honchar's novel, Ciclon, and just remove all the parts of it that he didn't like and publish it as Ante Ciclon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Nazara passed away. He wasn't ever able to do that, but I, I would have loved to have read that book. Uh, uh, well, it is International Book Day, and we're talking about a book, but also every book has a cover. So I was curious, uh, I don't know if people have seen the book, except for in the introduction. Can you comment on the cover design of the book? Was this your choice, the publishers? Did you consider maybe having a work of the Shistisatnik on the cover? Uh, is this the work of a Shistisatnik? Yes. <laughs> Well, uh, we, we don't know who the author of these cartoons is, actually. These are cartoons that I have found uh, on, uh, on an issue of uh, Literaturna uh, Hazeta. Uh, and, uh, and I thought that it was, I mean, uh, really surprising that these people were actually uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, present on the Literaturna Hazeta, that is the most official uh, uh, newspaper. Of, uh, of of Ukrainian culture, so uh, uh, at the time, so and I found that somehow these these drawings, I mean, uh, were were revealing something in in the character, in the way of being of of this figure. I mean, Lina Kostenko with this flower and 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 uh, Zuba like uh, uh, talking, and so I, I asked my partner to realize this uh, book cover for me using these uh, these drawings. Of course, I got in in contact with the uh, Literaturna Gazeta, Literaturna Ukraina to to have the permission to do that. And there is also another. Perhaps I have to 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 show it uh, on the uh, on the back cover. There is, I mean, uh, of course, Drach uh, also dancing somehow <laughs> on 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 poems. And and um, yeah, I, and I have to say that. Uh, and then after that, we decided with the background to use just the uh, uh, the first page of the Literaturna Gazeta, and I'm sorry because we didn't realize it until the, pub the, the book was published that actually on the first, uh, 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 on this first page, uh, there is an article that is entitled Bezdar Neshitachi, and it was, of course, no accusation to my readers, but we, after we did it, say, oh, 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 and so it was, of course, a Ukrainian looking at the book telling me, what is written here, Bezdar Neshitachi, and so it was, okay, but I mean, the crime is done now, so there's nothing I can do, I cannot take it uh, back, but, um, and and so also, I mean, this is this is another clue that, I mean, the Shistisatniki were not perceived as, as enemies by the Soviet Union, by the Soviet institutions, at least the beginning. I think that these drawings were uh, are from the 1962, 63, mm -hmm. something like that, I'm not sure. So, I mean, in those years, they were like legitimate uh, members of the cultural world, of the cultural, uh, of the uh, union of uh, Ukrainian writers. So uh, uh, it was absolutely normal to have them and to find them on the pages of Literaturna Gazeta. So that, that's the story behind this. Uh, no, I love the cover, it's, it's great. Uh, well, I have one more question because I think we need to move uh, to, to the questions from the public, but I just wanted to also ask you, um, Heather had mentioned about Ukraine archives being open. Um, I wanted to ask you what new source material in specific did you use uh, for this book, uh, for your study? And also, do you know if there's anybody else presently working on the Shiti Satniki, maybe in Italy, maybe elsewhere? Uh, so just sources and other people working. Uh, well, uh, I start from the second. Uh, I know there are some people working on the Shizdesiatniki because I sometimes have some, I hear some rumors, but I don't know who actually is working on, on, on this topic. And I think this is a pity because actually, I mean, uh, as Heather mentioned, I worked at the former KGB now, uh, uh, I mean, Service of uh, Security of Ukraine Archive, where you have a lot of uh, documents about the Shizdesiatniki. And when I went there, with, with my research on the Shizdesiatniki, I was able to see, so the, let's say the, uh, the process of um, um, uh, reviewing the material was still going on. And so I was able to assess only the personal files of people who uh, uh, did not, uh, let's say that who already died at the time of my research. 
and uh, so I don't know why I was like able to have uh, even Zuba personal file, even if I was theoretically no. But I, I just said these are the questions that you don't ask when you are in the archive. They give you something that you are not supposed to receive. You just read it, and you and you be silent, and you are going to be silent about it. And but I have to say that as I am now, I mean, I've been to Ukraine in February. I was able to work in the very same archive again, and uh, now they are doing. I mean, a very great job in uh, uh, digitalizing all these materials and there are many many more documents that the, the ones that I used and I mean I was uh, uh, speaking with Andri Ho that the, the book came out and I feel like I should write a new book about the very same topic but of course I'm not going to do it so uh, I mean this is like a, a suggestion for people willing to work on this topic I think that I mean uh, my 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 if somebody wants to go to that archive and see all the materials that are still there and I completely knew because I, I found them like not looking for them and now working on Chernobyl and working on the diaspora and nevertheless there are uh, many many uh, uh, new documents that I haven't seen on, on this topic. I mean, you, you could write a completely new book on, on this topic, completely original. So, I mean, this is an invitation. If you want to just like uh, study this topic, there is so much material that you can use. And, and it's all, I mean, uh, thanks to Andri Kohut, to the political changes in Ukraine. Now all these materials is available and it's, it's, a, it's a treasure, I think. So it's, why not use it? Well, thank you for getting the ball rolling on, on this research. So um, I guess I pass this along to, to questions from the audience. Yes, Heather. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it was, I was going to share the questions from the audience or, or are you? Are you are we ready for that now or? Sorry, I thought you were, that was your signal, sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 please, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for a, a very stimulating conversation. I have to say that I had millions of questions to ask uh, having read the book. And so it's fun to, you asked many of them. So it was fun <laughs> to hear. Now, um, uh, I, I just want to uh, say, as has been said, um, that we now have an opportunity for our audience to ask questions. Please go ahead and uh, write them into the Q&A section and I will, uh, read your questions and uh, uh, as we go along. Um, we do have uh, Marta Bohachevsky Homiak who is asking if she could um, ask, uh, make a comment. Um, Alexander, could you uh, allow Professor Bohachevsky? She's with us, so yes. Uh, I think I'm not muted. No. No, you're, you're not. You're alive. Hear you. You're live. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I promise to be short. I actually wrote down my comments so I wouldn't, given my age, uh, go on and on like some people. As a historian and as one who was involved in the events and issues dealing with Western relations with the former Soviet Union, and as someone who has for several, who actually personally knew several of your, Mr. Balazza, uh, heroes of, of the story, I want to welcome this study and I want to offer a few remarks to highlight the importance of the book and to chart the need for further study. My only substantive criticism of the study is that you miss the subversive but very pervasive sense of irony and sometimes of humor of the period. It's not your fault, since often the goal was to tweak the authorities, not necessarily to build a Ukraine now. There are two parallel stories of the 60s and parts of the 70s that need to be told before we piece together the intellectual history of modern Ukrainian society. The generation of the 60s succeeded where the 
predecessors of the 30s, whom some of them actually knew, at least knew of the works, and were personally acquainted with some of the children. Um, until we know that story, we won't be able to have the full image of the intellectual development of the period. We also forget how difficult it was to get any sort of information about Ukraine out in the Western media. Uh, here, the role of the first generation of the Shastadishatniki, the people who were able to get out West, and especially people like Korotic and some of the other cultural uh, diplomats that the Soviets managed to, to send actually made, an, in, made a difference in the amount of general knowledge that the media had of Ukraine. At the same time, um, the story of those of us in the West is not exactly known especially of those of us who have not been writing for obvious reasons. And frankly, I don't know how much of that story will be ever told. The stuff that is coming out now are personal uh, <laughs> stories that sometimes are self-published in the West and they create a really long, wrong impression of the period. I think you're exactly right of the manner in which most of those people of the 60s, 70s envisaged cultural work uh, eventually ending up in some sort of political adjustment of the system. Thank you very much for letting me speak. And I really enjoyed your book. I read it with my daughter. Go um, ahead, Simon. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for these kind words. I also have to say that, uh, I mean, I feel a little ashamed because I received your book, uh, uh, Professor Bokachevsky, you hold me up to your last book, uh, Ukrainian Bishop and American Church, but I haven't read it yet because it is in, it's located in Naples now, and now I'm in Turin, and because of COVID, even if it is right, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> this is the stories of the new time, but... the 60s. <laughs> yes, and I, I want to say, well, I think that you are absolutely right when you say that I haven't said enough in the book about irony and humor. I mean, there is just a very small hint at it in the third chapter, but that is like one of the things that I haven't been able to actually develop uh, well enough, because yes, there was a different way of looking at things and experiencing uh, the, the, also the, the Soviet reality in those years that I haven't been able to uh, describe properly, also because I didn't have enough documents. That and also I would say also the, uh, perhaps the gender question, the fact that the uh, uh, relationship between men and women in for the she says something was a little different, of course, you think Soviet Union. So, but uh, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. So this is like uh, something that someone else could uh, could do. And yes, difficult for information. You are right. I mean, the nine perhaps uh, a break in point for 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 the Western media was 1968 when Chernobyl's uh, um, uh, Who from Wheat uh, uh, came out in English and Chernobyl's work. Uh, uh, came out, but uh, uh, this is like a turning point when, when, when the Ukrainian question was able to uh, gather more attention on the international uh, arena. 
and um, and 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 yes, I mean, um, uh, you're also right in, in stressing that the their their way of thinking of cultural work as politics was was something absolutely new, and that has to be to be to be stressed. So thank you, thank you for these remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so our first written question is from Dora uh, Homiak. Um, and she asks, to what degree would you say that this feeling of community was one of the reasons that the individuals were able to be effective over several decades, despite various forms of repression? Did it contribute to the sustainability of the work by counteracting burnout and exhaustion? Uh, well, thank you very much for these uh, questions. Actually, yes, I would say yes, even more. I mean, uh, we have to think that as this group was a group of friends, they even help each other economically, practically. You have to think that when somebody got uh, imprisoned in, in the gulag or in a prison, uh, they were like... Uh, 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 the children, someone had to take care of the children, of the of the wife or 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 or, or uh, uh, the husband at home if they were sick or something like that. So uh, the solidarity of the group also worked as a practical machine, and this is something that, for example, Raisa Moroz uh, tells very well in her memories about the she's the She was not in knowledge with the group before her husband was arrested, Valentin Moroz, of course. But after that, when the, she certainly knew that she was in, in difficulties, they came to her, they introduced themselves and said, we, we are going to help you. So uh, this is very important. And of course, for throughout Soviet history, they had to, to experience, I mean, the uh, sense of, of, of community as a group of people working together was, uh, uh, was uh, very, uh, uh, very, very important, I, I think. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Myrna Kostash, um, and she asks, how do you explain the continued coherence of the community through the terrible repressions of their own members? There's a lot of interest in the community. Yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you for this question. Well, I'm not sure uh, what do you mean with uh, coherence. Uh, perhaps on, on one hand, I would say that uh, uh, as a group of friends, I mean, I don't know, these were people who grew up with very, uh, very clear uh, um, values of, of respect to one another. This is something that, I mean, also struck me. Lina Kostenko stressed it many times during my interviews that, uh, I mean, some values are values and they're absolute and you have to live by those values all the time. So, so if some people are your friends, you have to support them all the time. And, and for example, uh, Lina Kostenko was not doing real political work, but she always went to trials to control what was going on with the, uh, uh, with their friends involved in trials. And she wanted, I mean, to, to make the trials public. And so, uh, and uh, the coherence with, uh, of the community, uh, well, of course, uh, you can read this question also about like uh, coherence as the same opinions. Well, there were different opinions within the group, I have to say, there were different groups uh, of people or, or, I mean, differences about how to deal with the Soviet Union, especially in the late 60s and in the early 70s. And then after the repressions of 72, 73, actually the group uh, was not an artistic group anymore because they were not allowed to express their uh, uh, their art, their uh, their opinions. They were still friends, but they took different uh, um, different actions after that. So there is the coherence of the group that is the group of friends. They still are friends now, those who are still alive. But after that, uh, I mean, after 1972, 73. Uh, they, they made different decisions politically or even culturally speaking, I have to think, I have to say, and, and, and this is, I mean, what uh, sometimes also speaking with Ivan Zuba always says, I, I was not only a Shizde uh, I, I was alive in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and I changed, I uh, evolved as a personality, as an intellectual. So there is coherence as, as the community, yes, but I mean, the, the, the ideas changed through time. Thank you. And, and your question, uh, your, your comment just now about uh, Zuba uh, actually leads perfectly into the next question, which is from an, an anonymous attendee um, who asks, um, I find it very difficult to square your testimony about Zuba's 
uh, stated pro-Soviet views and his writing Internationalism or Russification, for which he was threatened with incarceration in the Gulag and actually had to recant. Um, do you comment on that? Yes, I mean, uh, I, I do understand that sometimes it's difficult to uh, make sense of all the different like pieces of this story. Um, we, when, when, I, when I talked with Zuba about, for example, his recantation, he, he, he told me that you have to think what it meant to be like uh, imprisoned. Uh, uh, he, he was in Kiev. He was not able for a very long time to have any information of what was going on outside. I, he told me, I, I, I was thinking that perhaps it, it was the uh, 1930s again. I don't know what was going on outside. And they actually showed him his wife and his daughter from afar. So to make him think that there was something bad going on with his family in order to obtain the recantation of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, of, of his positions, I say. And, and uh, I mean, concerning internationalism or Russification, well, you know, uh, this is very interesting because this is a book where uh, Zuba actually criticizes the Soviet Union from a Marxist point of view. So you have to think that at least for some time, these intellectuals were intellectual criticizing the Soviet Union, I would say, from the left, from what they believe to be a real uh, Marxist, a real socialist position. And I mean, uh, in the late 1960s, this may have changed also for Zuba in, in, in some ways. I mean, the uh, Roman Serbin says that when he met with Zuba in the, I do not remember, 69, perhaps he asked him uh, directly, uh, I mean, uh, what do you think? Do you really think that the Soviet Union is still the right place to, to build uh, uh, Ukrainian culture? And I mean, Zuba didn't reply, but I mean, the, the idea was perhaps summed up, so already had them. But I mean, in, in the end, I mean, the way they explain, we have to, I mean, uh, 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 believe uh, their words, because uh, what I think is that these people are very honest and they have no reason to conceal what they really thought. If even Zuba tells me that uh, in 1972, he still believed that he was a real communist and that the wrong communists were the Soviets. So I, I, have, to, I have to believe him, even if, uh, I mean, it, it may seem strange. And he, he then changed his, his ideas, of course, also about politics and, and so I think this is the, 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 the answer to this question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dora Homiak. Um, did the work of the Shistisiatmiki effectively illustrate the failure of the Soviet man by challenging core theory? Did that take root in certain circles, but not others? Uh, how does increased study of the 1960s now affect the current dynamics and discussion of Sovok in Ukraine today? Wow, what, what a difficult question, actually. <laughs> well, uh, I would say, well, uh, in some ways, yes, of course. I mean, the uh, ideals of the individuals of the Shizdesi ethnically radically uh, differed from the uh, typical uh, 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 Soviet, uh, 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 Soviet uh, man, Soviet uh, human being, and and so I mean, if you're referring to the to the Sovok, and um, uh, did that take root in certain circles, but not others? Uh, well, I, I I don't know what 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 to what, what to answer to that. Perhaps uh, mm, I would say. Uh, no, this is this is part of the originality of the thinking of the Shizdesiatnik. It is a uh, 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 critique of the of the center values of the central values of the Soviet Union of Stalinist culture and the this elaboration of the uh, uh, importance of the individual. And uh, I I would say that I'm not uh, uh, an expert to answer if this uh, uh, affects uh, the current dynamics and discussion of Sovok in, in today's Ukraine. I'm sorry if I'm not able to uh, properly answer to, to, to that. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, our next question is from Oleg Kotsuba. Um, and he asks, how did the work and the political positions of the Shistisiatniki contrast or align with later generations, such, such as those of the 1970s, uh, which experienced the repression of the early 1970s or the 1980s? 
And then uh, what is redeeming about the Shistisyatniki, given the prevailing negative view of them in Ukraine today? Wow, very good question. Well, actually, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in my opinion, the most important inheritance of the Shistisyatniki to the uh, following generations was uh, a, a, a complete new, a uh, completely new way of looking at the uh, at the nation. I mean, if you think of Ukrainian nationalism and the fact that it was a very right-wing nationalism during the Second World War, and then we have the uh, I mean the the war in Western Ukraine after the Second World War, uh, and, and I mean uh, the Shizdesyatniki elaborated a different way of uh, performing national identity and they also uh, elaborated a new way of conducting that fight for uh, national independence that was uh, based on the uh, for them new idea of the value of uh, human rights and so this is what they gave to the following generation this idea that uh, one has to focus on the importance of human rights and human rights are absolutely central in the political uh, elaboration this is something that for example even uh, uh, Lev Kolukyanenko when he met the Shizdesatniki for the first time in the Gulag immediately uh, 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 felt that these were new people with different ideas and they somehow uh, uh, conquered uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the souls of, of the previous uh, nationalists as well. I mean, people who used to fight against the Soviet Union with the rifle, the, they understood that perhaps there was another way that was even more effective. It was with, with words, with this uh, idea. And I think so, I mean, uh, and the following generation, of course, the 70s and the 80s are different from the Shizdesatniki because in the 70s and the 80s, if when you have dissenters, these people are not people who are uh, mainly concerned with uh, artistic problems. We have to keep in mind that, that the Shizdesatniki were uh, uh, poets, were writers, were artists. So their first uh, problem was, I mean, artistic express uh, expression and not uh, uh, the first was like uh, Ukrainian independence that, that came, I mean, afterwards, after the reflection on what was uh, Ukrainian, uh, what could be, what Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian heart could be. Uh, and, and, and in the 70s, the 80s, you have political activists. Some of them were also she's the Syatniki, but they are completely different. Now, I mean, you have a political, uh, uh, a fight going on between those who already uh, decided that the Soviet Union was, uh, 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 let's say, um, not the country they wanted to uh, to live in. Even if we to, uh, look at people like uh, 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 Chernobyl, it was clear that Chernobyl in the 70s is not a, a Soviet supporter anymore, and, and 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 that's the I mean I, I mean the, the the difference that uh, people in the 70s in the in the in the 80s are mainly political activists and and, and not uh, uh, artists uh, uh, thinking about what uh, art should be uh, in their uh, uh, they are mainly concerned with politics and not with, with with art. I don't know if I answered the question, but that's what I would would say. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Irina Sklokina, and mm -hmm. she uh, is interested in, in the relationship between your oral history approach and archival sources. And she asks, uh, how do you escape the trap of emotional engagement with your protagonists and following critical, a critical scholarly approach to your subject, especially in a politically loaded context? Uh... I think that I did not escape <laughs> uh, the trap of emotional engagement because, I mean, the uh, experience that I did uh, meeting uh, uh, the Shizdesyatniki was uh, an incredible uh, personal experience. These people were all so kind to me. Uh, I mean, and at the time, my Ukrainian was very, very bad. 
And nevertheless, they agreed to meet with me. And as they understood that for me, studying that period was very difficult, they decided me to help me in so many ways, like giving me books, making me uh, uh, meet more people. I mean, I was introduced to President uh, Yushchenko even. I mean, they did everything they could to help me during this research. So uh, um, it was difficult and perhaps it's not even completely uh, right to be completely uh, emotionally disengaged from this from this meeting of course from these meetings and from the fact that oral history is also like history always is meeting with the other and trying to get to uh, uh, trying to get to know him or her or them and so um, uh, and of course I mean uh, for me it was a little more it was a little easier nevertheless because I am not Ukrainian. And of course, I'm not involved in all the debates and polemics that can go on in, in, in Ukraine about the Shizdi setting and so on. So they also uh, talk to me much more freely because they didn't like feel that they were like the, the discussion was so loaded with the uh, with the political context. Thank you. Um we have a, a follow-up question related to interviews as well. Uh, can you speak more of your interview with Lina Kostenko? Uh, would you say that she considers herself a Soviet individual? Uh, I do not see that in her poetry or her public addresses. Well, uh, not now for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that at the beginning of uh, her career, she absolutely uh, uh, thought of herself as a Soviet. But you have to think, what, what do you mean when you say Soviet? I mean, for Lina Kostenko, being Soviet meant going to the Gorky Institute, where there was a, an exceptionally international environment of people coming from all the countries of the Soviet Union and all the countries of the Soviet bloc, going together as young poets, trying to do new poems uh, and thinking of art. And so that was like, uh, an enthusiastic experience for them. And that's for Lina Kostenko met being Soviet and not like the, the Soviet repressions or Stalin and so on and so forth. And so uh, for, for her being Soviet was like uh, meeting people from the Baltic uh, republics that could tell them about the repressions over there. So that like side of the Soviet experience for her, it was important. And so when you look at her, uh, and her poems, you have to look also for these other signs. If you think of Soviet Union just as the, uh, uh, the, 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 the repressions or the bad side of Soviet history, of course, that it, you cannot find it, or you can find only opposition to that kind of Soviet Union in, 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 in Lena Kostenko's uh, uh, poems. But if you look at the also, I mean, the, 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 the nice side of it, there was a nice side in the, in the uh, Soviet enterprise, so uh, uh, Lina Kostenko represented that uh, as well, I think. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions, uh, one from Mary Kalina and another from an anonymous uh, Questioner uh, about about the Shistasiatniki in the broader context of the 1960s. Um, were they were uh, uh, were they aware of and or influenced by dissident and protest movements in the West taking place at the same time? Um, the, the person mentions uh, some of the, uh, you know, American, the civil rights movement, anti Vietnam War, but there's the student movements more broadly. Um, so if you could say a few words about that. Well, I would say that it's uh, these are like different movements. I mean, the, 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 when you think of the 60s movements in the went, you think uh, mainly of uh, students and, and workers. I mean, if you're thinking of, uh, I don't know, France or Italy and so on. Uh, you have to keep in mind that the uh, she's the Satniki during the 60s were not that young. They already received their uh, uh, diplomas. They already graduated from university. They were already young people, young people working. And so their social situation is a little different. It's not the same as the students in, in, in the West. Uh, of course, there are some similarities in the intellectual development. For example, I, I said in the book that uh, uh, what uh, uh, Moroz 
thought about uh, standardization of culture and, and, and uh, uh, consumerism is very similar to what other intellectuals in the West like uh, Foucault or uh, Pasolini thought of these problems that, I mean, uh, emerged also in, in the 1960s. But the, the movements are, are, are different, are completely different from a social point of view. Yeah. Um, thank you. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I, just thinking back to what I said at the beginning, I also think that there's this broader, you know, surge of, of, of lower and middle class university educated people after in the 1960s that changes the changes the conversation. Yeah, also, I mean, in Soviet history, you have something more similar to the uh, 1968 in 1961. So, I mean, usually, I mean, the, the comparison is made. So it's, you have like different situations and, and, and that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question uh, from uh, Viktor Ostapchuk. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, you mentioned Schelist, who felt threatened by the ferment in Czechoslovakia and therefore asked for a crackdown. What do you think about Gorbachev, who naively allowed for freedom and the, then the USSR fell apart? Perhaps the Soviet leaders in the 1960s and 70s understood this and hence suppressed the movement. Well, I mean, I would say that uh, I don't think that Gorbachev was naive. I think that uh, Gorbachev, in, in a way, even if not, of course, uh, 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 in an identical way, but in some way he shared some of the values of the Shizdesiatniki. And so that's the reason why he started uh, this reform of the Soviet Union. I mean, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the relationship of Gorbachev, of his wife, uh, Raisa, you see that they knew these uh, these people, I mean, protesting, even 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 dissenters who were uh, 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 repressed in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, and so on. So the reason is not naivety; is the fact that uh, Gorbachev uh, set for himself like an impossible task that was to, of reforming the Soviet Union, and the, the Soviet Union was not reformable. As this is the Setniki would agree, also in the end, they also, I mean, like uh, understood that the Soviet Union was not possible to to, to reform. So I think. That, um, that is what I would say about that. Thank you. Um, we have a, another comment from an anonymous attendee. Um, you speak of the nationalists of the Second World War period. Do you think it possible that the 60 years uh, distanced themselves from that point of view as a way of surviving? Um, and that's an interesting question about the, the, the broader context of, of Soviet Ukraine in the 50s as they're coming of age. And this, this person also, uh, sorry, also asks whether it, it whether we could say that Zuba likely argued and wrote within a Marxist framework in order to criticize the system on its own ground. So, what do you think about that? Well, the second is uh, truly true, uh, <laughs> truly true. But I mean, um, uh, the question perhaps is if uh, was Zuba uh, a socialist and communist or Marxist, and I think that he was for a certain amount of time, yes, it was. And uh, um, uh, the question is a very good question. I mean, uh, this question is, is uh, important, perhaps, especially for people coming from Western Ukraine that were part of the uh, movement of the Shizdesiatniki, because they had, for example, in their family history, examples of people who actually, like, took the rifle and, and fought against the Soviet Union. So. Um, uh, as far as I've been able to study them, nevertheless, I think that then when they converted to this way of uh, fighting the Soviet Union based on the respect of human rights and so on, they were sincere in their uh, uh, in their conversion, that these are not people who are just saying, of course, I mean, there were some considerations like if we uh, create a party, the Soviet Union is going to repress us immediately because this is illegal or something like that. They were making some like strategical consideration. But I mean, when you talk about the importance of human rights, I think that even people who at the beginning had a more nationalistic uh, uh, mm, let's say classical uh, Ukrainian nationalistic uh, uh, underground uh, background. Uh, nevertheless, when they met the Shizdesiatniki and the Shizdesiatniki came in from like uh, uh, central and eastern Ukraine, uh, the, the, didn't even know 
uh, what the Oun and Upa uh, were. So they had clearly no contact with them. Uh, people from Western Ukraine were, were convinced that yes, these were right claims that the uh, uh, human rights really mattered, that individuality was uh, a, a value uh, worth of defending. So I think that uh, uh, they were sincere and that this is not just uh, a tactical reason for not being uh, uh, repressed by the Soviet Union, also because they got repressed nevertheless. Uh, and so uh, uh, in the end, they didn't, did, it didn't save them uh, in the end, I think. Thank you. Um, Viktor Ostapchuk has a follow-up uh, question, which actually gets at one of the big questions of, of, of late Soviet uh, history. And it's, it's how, how important the national movement was. He's wondering whether uh, Gorbachev's project fell apart because of the national question. But, but in fact, I think this, uh, this affects uh, this this raises a really interesting question more broadly about your work and and you know it's 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 um, why why should people uh, who study the late Soviet Union more broadly what will they find of interest here and how does it help us to think about the uh, the, the relative importance of the national question as one of the explanations for the, the, the failure of, of Gorbachev's project to renovate the Soviet Union? Well, uh, I am actually not sure what to answer to this question because I am again studying these, uh, these dynamics uh, again because I'm studying now Chernobyl and the way uh, politicians, both dissenters and communist politicians reacted to that and how they, so um, I, I'm not sure. I think that nevertheless, we can uh, say that uh, the uh, political ideas of the Shizdesiatniki uh, somehow uh, relaunched or reformed uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalism on a new basis that was the uh, respect of human rights and only after that, the national question. And um, uh, that somehow cha changes the game because if you think that uh, uh, human rights come first and only after that, uh, national rights also come, you have a different respect also for the people that are different for you and also for different nationalities. And as I see now, and I mean, I'm studying with documents, the project of building a new national uh, country in the, at the end of the 1980s, at the beginning of the 19, 1990s. And I can see that, I mean, there are discussions going on uh, uh, between, I mean, old communist politicians and the Shizdesiatniki uh, who finally came uh, uh, out again and they are uh, uh, in the Ruch movement and, and uh, Ruch movement, uh, <laughs> in the Ruch. And, and, and uh, I mean, uh, they have this idea of not building an ethnic state. Ukraine is a republic and citizenship is the central concept uh, that on which the new Ukrainian state after the Soviet Union has to be uh, founded. And that, that I think comes directly from this idea of the Shizdesiatniki of not, I mean, being absolutely Ukrainian, think that Ukrainian culture is absolutely central to their individual identity and to the communal identity, but nevertheless, no, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, the state has not to discriminate on the basis of ethnicity. And this is, I mean, even if it seems it looks like a contradiction is not a contradiction, it is possible to build a national state without like repressing other, other, uh, other nationalities that are living in, in the same uh, political 
uh, 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 organism like like a state and this is the idea that comes up i mean at the end of the 1980s and, and 99 and the beginning of the 1990s when the soviet union is collapsing and these people are talking about what are we going to do with our states when we are finally able to fund it again and so i, I think that uh, 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 of course the soviet union fell apart because of the national question as well i mean among the other problems that the soviet union had there were many uh, but um, I, mean, I don't know this is what I would answer uh, uh, to to uh, Ostapchuk, uh, to Peter Ostapchuk, and to Heather uh, now to her. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, I don't think we have any other questions. Are there any other questions from the from the audience? Well, um, hearing hearing. Oh. Of course, the phone rings just at this moment. <laughs> um, hearing none, I, uh, I, I think we will uh, bring our conversation to a close. Thank you so much to all of our participants, uh, to uh, Dr. Andrejczuk for his stimulating questions. Uh, to um, to all of our audience participants for their their many comments and questions that have really I think given us lots of food for thought and of course to uh, Dr. Belitza for uh, uh, wide ranging answers and a very stimulating and exciting book and I I really do invite uh, all of our listeners to to purchase and read this book it's uh, it's very readable and I I I I think that's one of the great benefits and and. And I think that we can see you thinking about your sources as you read and, and it, it, thinking about, for example, to go back to the question of oral history, you, you, you are interrogating, you're saying, you know, she says this, but in, I can see from the documents but that she was doing this at the time. And, and, and so I, I think that uh, it's, a very, it's a very thoughtful uh, and, and enjoyable read. And, I, and I, uh, I'm so delighted that we've been able to have a, a real conversation about it today. If I may add something. Yes. I just wanted oh, to say here. that, hi. I, yes, I, I'm very happy that I could make it. Uh, in this Zoom uh, epoch, I had to be half an hour Still half an hour ago, I had to be in Ukraine, but I, now I'm here. I'm very happy to see everybody. I just wanted to, and I'm very happy to, to hear this very uh, exciting conversation. I wanted to say that for the next few days, just few or three or four days, the book will still be at 25% off. If you purchase it on, online on the Seos Press website, then it will be back to its regular price. So if you got interested, and I hope you did. If you don't have the book yet, and if you uh, got interested uh, based on this discussion, you have three or four days to, to get a discount. Okay. Thank and you very much. Simone. And may Marco, Marco Steck, the director of our of, of CIUS yeah. Press. If I may say just a few words as Marco spoke, such as uh, now, I, I would like to thank him a lot and also uh, Roman Senkus, because I mean, either you mentioned the readability of the book. Well, you can understand that my English is very far from perfect, from perfection. And so, I mean, I have to, to thank, I mean, the uh, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies Press uh, for all the uh, dedication they that had in uh, improving my book and improving my English. They spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of work in doing that. So I'm, I'm really, uh, I mean, thankful uh, uh, to, to, to Marco and to Roman Senko, who is not here, but it was also, I mean, very important to me. I mean, the comments and all the work that he has done and so i wanted to 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 thank them i mean uh, publicly the day that it is to be in knowledge that i i owe them uh, this and then uh, of course uh, F frank wanted to uh, yes i was going to uh, welcome frank this i the director of the, the yatsik center for uh, the study of history your ukrainian uh, history yeah and may i make a, a short announcement yeah uh, uh the uh as we know simone now is working on the diaspora as well. And the diaspora, as I think Marta Bohachevska from Yak told us and pointed out, played a very significant role in the time of the 60s and shortly thereafter. Uh, many of us in the past two or three days have been moved by the loss of uh, one of our greatest translators for Ukrainian scholarship, uh, but also political activist Marta Skorupski. 
uh, and this loss is, is we all feel in many ways, but I want to point out that although we may discuss and later we'll be discussing her, her genius as a translator, uh, her acuity uh, in understanding scholarship, but she also was a political activist. Uh, and I think one of the uh, ways that I first encountered her was as the editor of the digest of the Soviet Ukrainian press, uh, a publication which came out from Prolog in New York, which was essential at the time of the Shistyatnike uh, to produce material in English. Uh, I wrote my BA thesis on the Ukrainian intelligentsia after World War II and the Shistyatnike, and I could only convince my professors to let me undertake such a thesis by having that English language material that I could bring to them to say, you see, something is happening in Ukraine. Uh, you may not uh, be paying attention to it, and it is not what you expect. It is a new kind of people. But it was a tremendous, uh, I think, gift to uh, the Ukrainian community that Martha gave us. So I wanted to mention that. And I also uh, wanted as well, when we are talking about this tremendous uh, uh, contribution Simone has made to the 60s, uh, study of the 60s, and then to say other people should write new books on the basis of the archival material uh, makes us all feel that uh, there is much to do. I also uh, look forward to what he's going to do with the Ukrainian diaspora to put many of us in our places uh, when he writes this up. Uh, these are still times which we remember, we have very different views. Uh, Martha Bochelska Komiak has pointed out that not all of it's written, so there's a more oral history project in it, but I think it will round out that approach. Uh, so we're very grateful to him for undertaking all of these uh, the eye from Italy of this, I think, is a distant eye that helps us. And then uh, I also wanted to point out that we will be having book discussions in both May and June. In May, we still hope to have a discussion uh, on a book on the Western Ukrainian uh, Republic and the Jewish community at that time, a translation from Yiddish uh, we don't have a date set definitely for that. But uh, what I also wanted to say uh, is that on June the 11th, we will be having uh, a discussion of the last of the series of Mikhailo Hrushevsky's work to come out. It turned out to be volume two on Kiev and the Rus, a discussion on that. And that of course was a project back to Marta Skorupska where she contributed so greatly by the publication of that first volume. I think everyone who's taken part in today's uh, discussion can be grateful to, uh, of course, above all, uh, he, the author who wrote the book, uh, but also the interlocutor who discussed it, the member of the prize jury, and all of the people involved in our press that uh, we were fortunate and had the honor uh, that Simone came to us with such a book that's going to, I know, have a great impact. Thank you. Cool. Th thank you very much, I mean, for these kind of words. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I owe uh, uh, to, to, to the Ukrainian diaspora the, the beginning of this book, because without the help of the people uh, allowing me to come to, to America and finally work in a nice, library where I could find the first uh, books by the Shizdesiadnik and read them, I would not have been able to do this. And of course, I mean, now the, the new uh, research on the diaspora, <laughs> it also <laughs> was, uh, I mean, uh, it benefited from, from help from you. So thank you very much. And I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's an honor to, 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 to study the history of Ukraine and, and, and of Ukrainian people. It is so, so interesting and so, uh, and and um, in a way, I mean, there is this theory that history is make friends, is making friendships, and and, and these these uh, relationships that came out from from research are are, are friendship with with the uh, topic of my research, the she's the Sapniki, but also with all you people around it. So I'm I'm really uh, thankful, and 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 that's it. So I'm and so. 
uh, uh, it's, it's also your, I mean, uh, the, the good part in the books, you are also, I mean, authors of these books. The bad parts, of course, they are on me. <laughs> so. <laughs> and with that gracious comment, I think we, we can uh, thank, uh, thank Simone and uh, wish him all the best in his future research. And we're very much looking forward to, to uh, those, your future research and that, those next books on the Shistis Yatmaki. So thank you very much to all of our participants and uh, have a good rest of the day, whether it's your morning or your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.